Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny to all of my returning subscribers. Hey, how you doing? And for those of you who are new to the channel, welcome, kick your feet up, subscribe to this family friendly channel and don't forget to click the notification bell so you don't miss any posts. Also follow me on Instagram at the same profile name so you don't miss the sneak peeks of what's coming up next. In this video, it's my voiceover performance of The Girl Before, season one, episode one. I give a full episode recap with photos offset to the side and then I give my review at the end. No need to dig around and keep all of the minute marks in the comments. It's all coming up next. The sounds of water glossing over a tall cemented wall. A man collects water and soap to scrub mysteries while holding back hysterical tears. It's not a typical London one bed, but look around. She can't believe her eyes. It's like an art gallery. Three years later, it's like deja vu. Another inquirer of the home. The owner, now renting the estate, has a set of rules. He is the architect. No pictures, no carpets or rugs, no books, no ornaments, no children, no planting anything in the garden. The list entails of 20 rules. No magazines, on and on. There aren't any light switches. Everything in the home is automatic. You wear a jewelry piece that controls it all. The man who built this must be very strange, but the current realtor confirms is actually pretty charming. He interviews all possible tenants. So far, no one has passed the questionnaire for over three years. As one worries and wanders around, the automatic shower frightens her. There are no large closets. There's only one storage cupboard. Everything must be on a hanger, nothing on the floor. Surprise inspections determine if residents can stay. It's in the contract. Sai says if it weren't for all the rules, they would stay. Besides, they're very messy. She is disappointed, and Sai wants to look at other flats. Current time, an inquirer thinks that the home is so satire that it can't remain empty. Feels like it's waiting for someone. They then say goodbye to the house. Question one, please make a list of every possession you consider essential in your life. Well, that would probably be about five things. They laugh at the question, but it brings the debate of minimalism. Redecorating her current bedroom won't solve anything. She needs to be in a new place. The previous inquirers review the question as well. Sai tells M, don't waste your time reading it. What if it's a trick question? He doesn't like a lot of stuff, remember? There's hardly any room for clothes. We'll skip it. Question two. Would you sacrifice yourself to save ten innocent strangers? <sighs> These questions are interesting. Maybe this is the start of something new. Emma Matthews, the princess of Les. Sai so still isn't interested, and she's frustrated because he promised they would move soon. She closes the wind open door, revealing a girl's nursery. Sai doesn't want M to get her hopes up. They may not get the home. They're greeted and then escorted to meet Edward. Edward offers coffee, but it's evident Simon wants questions and certain polite justice to be directed directly towards him. She's my girlfriend, Emma. Now to business. Tell me why you want to live at 1 Folgate Street. M wants to live somewhere incredible. It would be like a dream. There's a pause of what to say next. Then Emma breaks the silence, saying the home would be a change for them. They were burgled. She was alone, and Simon was out with friends. The burglar had a knife. One Fulgate Street will help her be a stronger person. She wouldn't be the person anymore that would allow someone to walk over her. Emma's nervous hand knocks over hot coffee everywhere. It's okay, says Edward, and he instructs Alicia to help him with the cleanup. Simon apologizes on behalf of Emma, but Edward offers a word of advice. Never apologize for someone you love. It makes you look like a prick. He thanks them for stopping by and he'll let them know the final word. Edward then critiques another architect about how his designs weren't significant enough. He doesn't care if he worked on it for six months. 
Now it's time to speak with Jane Cavendish. She wants to know if Edward won the argument. His past business partner, he explained, didn't see eye to eye. That's all. Jane scoffs. <laughs> Why? Because he's not a minimalist? Edward does not in any way consider himself a minimalist. When we observe the things in our lives that have significance and get rid of the excess, you'll be surprised of what you have left. My house makes demands of its residents. His technology talks about UX, user experience. The housekeeper system gathers data from whoever lives at 1 Volgate Street. It's to improve the user experience in real time. Habits, what temperature you prefer while taking a shower, that kind of thing. Also, other things are psychological. Over time, the assessment questions, answers may change. Even Google and Facebook know more about you. It's what you pay to live there. Data in exchange for rent. They have no shortage of applicants. And Jane finds it interesting that they have several applicants but have yet to find anyone acceptable. It's been over three years. Edward thinks maybe now they have found the applicant. Jane doesn't want to make a speech about why they should pick her or why she wants to live there. She only notes that he built a home with integrity and she wants to live there with integrity. The agent said you lived there at one point, correct? He says another building on the same site, not the one that he's renting. That house never got built. Before she can ask why, a co-worker alerts. Someone is crimping the fiber optics. Edward has to leave and instructs Alicia to escort Miss Cavendish out. Jane can't help but to ask Alicia, why didn't he live in the house? She learns that one Folgate Street was meant to be his family's house. Then his family died, his wife and their son. She was one of their business partners. They designed it together. Alicia is surprised he even mentioned it to Jane. He almost never does. Emma speaks with the psychologist. Her experience with the burglar still gives her flashbacks. She lets her know it's a normal response, Emma, from the trauma. The brain will make you feel and remember those experiences as if they're happening to you now. What about Simon? You mentioned before his response was a bit trying. She thinks if he were there, he would have beaten up the intruder, then called for help. But she believes that maybe he would have been stabbed. She lets Emma know that society has a construct of what masculinity is in these situations, when it's undermined that any man can be threatened. Emma thinks that it was all her fault and doesn't want to talk about it anymore. Jane meets with Rachel. Rachel is sorry to hear her news. She got them a quiet room to talk. Jane is ready and has ideas on new work strategies. Rachel breaks the excitement. She talked with HR and her maternity cover, Belinda. They can't just terminate her contract. Instead, they want to extend Jane's leave. She doesn't have to come back so soon. Are you sure you want to return now? Jane wants to get back to work. She needs to keep busy. They both hold back tears. Rachel says that she's sure that there's a role appropriate that's just not anything that they have now, at least not client-facing. The work team brainstorms words that also associate with value. Energy, positivity, dynamism, uh, reliability. Now it's Emma's turn to contribute a word and she hasn't written down dynamism. But isn't that the same as energy, Emma asks. They proceed, what exactly is the flow to O's highest purpose? Emma talks under her breath, Ugh, supplying companies with water coolers. Sal interrupts, he's loving a room full of wonderful minds hard at work. 
People in the room say that they're having a hard time coming up with a mission statement. And he has an idea. Make more water cooler moments. Oh, and Emma right now is missing calls. <laughs> Saul announces to everyone she is the best assistant that I've ever had. Just don't get on the shots, huh? The room laughs, but Emma is clearly embarrassed. So how'd it go, Em? I was hoping that marketing would be more exciting and said it's reliability and positive. Mm. There's an email. They got the house. Jane reports to her friend. Her feeling Belinda still has a contract for six months. But some good news. A text. She passed the interview and got the house. She can move in next week. Her friend is happy for her. You deserve some good news. There's progression of packing and getting rid of non-essentials. Emma wears an access bracelet and welcome flowers are nice. Everyone unpacks and there are clear differences in how each of the tenants follow the rules. Jane then hides a box underneath the bed of clearly what she feels are essential. Memories. What's that? <laughs> music. Our home plays music. It has moods. Let's see, are we feeling peaceful, playful, or productive? Let's be playful, Sai. The tunes surely bring joy and laughs. Jane notices there's a timer of when to remind her when to stop brushing her teeth. When the timer reaches zero, the lights dim and create a calm to prepare her for bed. Good night, Jane. Sai warns about M drinking in the bed. Eddie had a thing for people spilling drinks all over him. Now they have to cool down the house. He loves it now. He's booked a table for her birthday next week at a new shop in Saffron. Why don't we just have a party? Invite a few friends over, make them jealous. They could even invite Edward. The question makes him uncomfortable, but Emma shrugs it off. And says, yeah, it's a bad idea. Jane tries to work out and stomach pains slow her down. As she leaves for each day, more flowers. Jane calls Alicia. She appreciates the welcome flowers, but it's starting to become a bit much. Well, Edward is in America. If he wanted a flower delivery request, he would have had instructed me to do so. Is there a florist's name or a card? Jane sees that there's a card. Emma, I love you forever. Who's Emma? Alicia gets cold. Call the florist direct. That has nothing to do with us. She seems to hang up in Jane's face with anger. Jane makes dinner, then invites her friend along with her husband and children. What a lovely home. Are you adjusting well? How are things at your home? Well, my husband Charlie, his firm is taking about with redundancies. Martha may have dyslexia, Freddie's desperate for a guinea pig, and um, yeah, so it's a lot. When the kids make a fuss outside, Jane quickly stops them, as the garden isn't a place for play. Jane apologizes for the limited software and utensils. There's not much room for storage. Charlie wants to know her and Maya. He just saw someone about to leave for flowers. Jane quickly chases down the mystery man. Please, sir. He turns around. It's Simon. He says the flowers aren't for her. They're for Emma. He wouldn't keep bringing the flowers if she wouldn't keep taking them. It would have been her birthday this week. She would have been 30. Jane apologizes and learns that Emma died in the house three years ago. How did she die? Sai answers, it depends on who you ask. Jane is rattled, but Charlie soothes her. People die in houses all of the time. And her friend, afraid as well, says, old people die in old houses. This house is still new and it seems so perfect. Also, Emma was our age. Jane can't sleep. 
on the housekeeper's search path, she enters one full gate street death. There are no results. She then goes to her cell phone and lots of links appear. It's a chilling discovery. Emma Matthews, death unexplained coroner rules. Her face then seems similar, as if they were twins, maybe sisters. Simon preps drinks for the housewarming. He's so distracted by Emma's dress, he cuts his finger. The house later warns that it's reached its maximum capacity. Friends are impressed with the home's cool features while everyone makes a mess. Emma then partakes in certain white lines on the table. The house is a wreck and Emma in her high state is encouraged to leave to go to a club. Sai tries to stop Saul and so tells him he's boring. They should go out. Gladly, Saul State grabs him to go home. While in bed, Sai tries to initiate sex, but Emma says no. Sai can't understand what's going on. When they first got together, it was every night in every room. Emma says that it was before the burglar shoved a knife in her face. Sai apologizes. There's no rush. I didn't know that you were still uncomfortable. He says, I love you, but she doesn't say anything in return. A fox enters the open garden door and Emma can't sleep, crying throughout the night. In the morning, she's awakened by a phone call. It's the police. D.S. William and her boss? They're outside. They're saying that they want to talk to me. They scramble to clean, but it's no use. Detective Inspector James Clark has news on the burglar. The person in question has been arrested, carrying out another burglary. They were able to recover a number of stolen items, including Emma's phone. They need to ask her some more questions in private. Sai says this house isn't too private. Detectives suggest going down to the station with Emma, alone. Emma says, it's okay, just go ahead. The detective apologizes for the question, but when they examined her phone, they recovered a video of the intruder forcing a sexual act on Emma. Is that correct? Emma, can you tell us who that was? Emma's only response, he had a knife. First he took my phone off of me, then made me do what you saw. He said if I told anyone, boyfriend or police, that he sent it to everyone, my contacts, family, work. The detectives have to ask something else. Is there any chance he could have left any DNA behind? On the bed or possibly your clothes? It can be really powerful corroborating evidence. Emma says no. The detectives want her to know any forced act is a crime and we want to get this individual convicted. Sai is devastated and saddened for Emma. He wants to console her the best way he can. He only wants to know why didn't she tell him. Emma said he would find it difficult and I was scared. He would have wanted to tell the police and she didn't want to. I know I can be an idiot sometimes, but I wouldn't have made you do anything you didn't want to do, especially concerning the police. What does this say about us? That you couldn't come to me about something as big as this? This isn't about you, Sai. Jane continues to research about Emma. She receives a call that she has a visitor. She heads down and says hello to Richard. He didn't know she was back to work. Is she sitting in on the review? How is motherhood suiting you? What did you have, boy or girl? Richard, hello, I'm Linda. Uh, hello, I'm Jane Cavendish. You're my maternity fill-in. It's nice to meet you, Linda. It's pleasant hellos, as they're all happy to meet one another. Linda then takes Richard to speak in private. There's a slight mix-up. Jane's visitor 
was Edward. He wanted to apologize for the home and withholding information about the previous tenant. He didn't want it to be offsetting. It was an accident on the stairs. It could have happened to anybody in any house. He will now have to leave her and get back to work. Before he leaves, Jane invites company to some coffee. Jane orders milky cappuccino. Edward requests double macchiato. You couldn't help but overhear. You lost a child? Yes, a little girl. Her name? Her name was Isabel. Thank you for asking. Most people don't. It was a stillbirth. 39 weeks. You lost a child too? Edward confirms. You know, Jane, people really don't pour out their love. They pour out their platitude, don't they? Sorry for your loss. They don't understand how accurate that word was, loss. They had one man gambled with life, genetics and happiness, and I lost. Grief isn't that different to the feeling of the most terrible crushing defeat. Jane exhales with relief. Yes, that's exactly what it feels like. I can't help but wonder, did I want her enough? There's an investigation for post-mortem. I'm still waiting to hear. He encourages her not to blame herself. Jane was sad. They wouldn't even let her have a cesarean. Her baby died, and three days later, she had to be born. It felt wrong somehow. Edward says it's wrong for a child to die before its parents. Jane cries, and he wants her to cry, and jokes that tears need to be released because they have chemicals. The waitress, she returns with the drinks and thinks that she's crying because of the gentleman and calls him a name. They can't help but to laugh after she leaves. Jane apologizes for talking too much, but he doesn't mind. He has to ask her something and apologizes for being direct. He wants to have a relationship with her, although there's something he needs to explain. People answer to buildings differently and very easily accumulate the unnecessary Valentine's Day cards, romantic gestures, date nights, all of the clutter of the conventional relationships. They're all doomed before they begin. What if you strip all of that back? What do you have here? A relationship encumbered by convention, expectations, A relationship that lasts as long as it's perfect and not a moment longer. Jane says that she likes romantic gestures. Ah, Jane, but are they essential to your life? Jane apologizes. I'm sorry. I'm just not in that space for relationship, no matter how minimal. He understands. And she has to return to work. When she returns, there's flowers with a card. I liked talking to you. E. M. I did some research on your crazy house. It seems someone might have died there. Two people when it was being built. The architect was visiting the site with his wife and a baby when a wall fell on them. After lengthy research, Monfort abandoned the original plans and rebuilt the house in a minimalist style in which he's since become synonymous. Emma is in shock. It's like the monument. Emma, you need to see this. That's its wife. She looks just like you. M comes home to Cy cooking. He wanted to do something special to say sorry for being such a jerk. He even got her an early birthday present. She's excited to open, recognizing it's from breakfast at Tiffany's. She loves the gifts and thoughts behind everything. She also apologizes. 
there's a flash of another question. Evaluation statement. I could never be happy with a second-rate partner. Agree or disagree? Jane displays her new flowers. There are cuddles and Emma tries to initiate sex, but Sai can't stop thinking about what happened to her. Emma becomes enraged, calling him needy and treating her as if she's damaged goods. Sai stops her. He loves her and in his mind she's perfect. She tells him, I don't love you, Sai. Not to stay with you forever. This isn't working. And I feel trapped. And Sai tells her she doesn't mean that. She's feeling vulnerable because of what that man did to her. And this place, this place is like a pressure cooker. It's impossible to try to live this way. Emma says it's not that. And she wants him to move out. Sai can't believe his ears and is left speechless. He leaves with his belongings and bags, completely distraught. Jane sips the last of her wine and the house system suggests a song. It's a song with words that express you're the only one that resonates, even when you're telling me no. The lights within the house display different calming colors. The music then suddenly stops. She then calls Edward. She's been thinking what he mentioned at the cafe. I think I like that. Edward then places a lifelike figurine in an architect house model. And the small statue looks like Jane. And now it is time for your favorite part of the video. That's right, my review. So HBO has decided to take the book, The Girl Before, and put it into a film adaptation of the book written by J.P. Delaney. The four-part miniseries got a very low in ranking review when it comes to the book translated to film adaptation but I still wanted to give it a look I still wanted to take the time to view it for myself look at the cinematography look at the writing and just to give it a shot with this first episode I didn't think it was too bad I mean seeing how we have to summarize everything into four episodes that are one hour I think that's pretty fair and I wanted to give the recaps and the reviews not being a reader of the book but looking at the series as its own entity so for episode one i thought it was pretty good because it it gives you a good sense of mystery and a good sense of trying to put the pieces together yourself and figure it out i wonder how people feel that actually read the novel and then looked at the miniseries i'm pretty sure like a lot of the times they leave a, a lot of in-depth details out maybe but i i don't know i didn't want to read the book in order for it to be a spoiler for the series with episode one i have always been a big fan of legal series mystery series novels so this was something that was refreshing in order for me to look at and to build mystery of i, I loved it i loved the fact that the cinematography was very crisp and it gave me a sense of being in a time now where we talk about UX. We talk about user-friendly items or things that connect to, connects us with technology to where we become more dependent on technology. Netflix, if you noticed as well, with all of the things going on, especially with the pandemic and, and with, with technology and when it comes to user-friendly things, that there people are obsessed with apocalyptic movies about when data takes control control of the human, taking out the aspect of the cultive, the cognitive aspects of learning, depending on having our own sense of comfort. So when we look at the plot of owning, being in this home in exchange for paying rent, looking at it as if I were the person that was presented with that opportunity, you are questioned of, is it worth the trade-off? Uh, having 
things that are only essential and things that you need. And it proves that even though some things may not be essential to your life, meaning you, you need to survive, there's a human aspect of memories, um, reading, writing, being able to make decisions for yourself, and also having what's called variety and options. Not having those things can be a damper on the way that we lives our li live our lives. That's what makes this first episode pretty eerie. The character of Edward, which to me is beautif beautifully written, is that automatically we can see that this is a psychological thriller. And the first example, when it comes to Emma, Emma has something tragic that has happened to her. And when she's speaking with the psychologist in this episode, over and over again, there is this description as if, if only he was there, if only Cy was there, if only he had did this, if only he had kind of like transitioning that blame of maybe this wouldn't have happened to me if Cy wouldn't have been there. Maybe I would have felt better if he had done blank. And the psychologist tells her, you know, society places those, those pressures and those things of what men should do if they're in a situation. But he was, he was in the situation, if he was in a situation, he bit would have been just as frightened. We, or, you know, we can't behave as if if, if he were there, things would have been better because we don't know that. So when she has her first interaction with Edward, there's this sense of comfort. There's this sense of safety. He's very domineering. He's very punctual with everything that he says. Um, checking Simon when he says, hey, you know, don't, don't apologize for people you love because that makes you look a certain way. There's automatically that intimidation factor of, wow, I think this Edward guy is so much better than the guy that I have now. The mentioning him when they're having pillow talk about how about we invite him to the housewarming party. All of these things that just pull us in in the first episode and kind of getting us into the character of how Edward is able to use what he knows when it comes to data, when it comes to the psychological mind of how we view things in life. What are essential? What's important? What's not important? So it makes the vulnerable female in the situation pull in to that quote unquote strong theory of Edward. When we see Jane start to express her feelings and those states of losing her child and that common ground of knowing what it feels like to lose someone it's like the the fisherman throwing in the net and catching a lot of those things that will pull you into him feeling comfortable about sharing about the deceased family mem members sharing the information of feeling that sense of comfort and oh he knows exactly how I feel he knows what I need he knows what I want and then also making her say, well, I thought this way about a relationship all the way to the fact of her being completely alone in this cold, destitute environment of just seeing the wall, being alone with her thoughts. Her friends are coming over with children that are not really in environments where they can kind of play and get along and kind of, you know, kick up dust and have fun. Even the garden is an environment for adults that really isn't fitting to really have a lot of people over to make them feel comfortable. So when she does have that vulnerable moment, she starts to think, well, what you told me when we were at the cafe, that's starting to make a little bit more sense now. Someone who has not read the book, I can understand that this flow of writing will let us know how it was easy for this character of Edward to kind of pull those characters in. I love a mystery and just making a guess that, of course, it takes more than Edward to make this housekeeper experience, program experience, UX data and everything that's been set up in his house by him himself. He has to have a team of people to help him with that data, to analyze the data and being able to put it together and make some sense. This sort of data science and data analytics prospect that makes it more understandable. There's a team of, of people. Speaking of teams, when it comes to the office, there are clearly employees that are working with him when it comes to the underlying aspect of knowing his personal business. Oh, well, he usually doesn't tell people about that. And I'm surprised that he said something. So that just let me, that just made me realize that there are probably a lot of people on a different payroll that keep 
keeps certain secrets and keeps certain things that happened on lock. Very, very big red flag when it doesn't open on the housekeeper search when she tries to find out, find out more information about Emma. But when she goes on her phone, there's tons of stuff. So there's this layering of mystery that I love. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you could live in a place that had certain rules in exchange for rent. Let me know if you think it's worth it. Would you even go through it <laughs> to save some money? Um, let me know if you find it very interesting that Edward has this grasp and this pull in of dominance, this pull in as being a dependent to tell me how you feel and to tell me to be safe. And it's his poise that really brings those characters in. The fact, of course, that they all look the same is the big one. But just that uh, that character, how he's how he's written and how he carries himself is just an open door to what we're about to ro walk into when it comes to this mini series. Let me know what you think. Leave your comments below. If you have read the novel or if you finished the mini series, please feel free to leave comments about what you thought about its entirety. But please put a spoiler alert warning before your comment to at least allow others to make a decision if they want to read your comment or come back and respond. In the meantime, in between time, stay tuned for the recap and the review of episode two.